Um, as Cynthia mentioned, from Centurion Apartment Reed, I've been uh, at Centurion just over 10 years. My anniversary was back in June. I didn't get the gold watch, so I'm a little upset by that, but great to be here today. A uh, quick background on Centurion. Uh, the fund itself, the apartment read, has been around since August of 2009. Um, it was the precursor to that was an LP run by our president and founder, Greg Romit. I'll show you his bio in a second, but he had an LP for friends and family that he launched in 2006. Um, and prior to that, he incorporated Centurion in 2003. Uh, so those LP assets that created or were created in 2006 rolled over into the read in August of 2009, uh, about 55 million. Since then, we've grown considerably um, and reached 7.5 billion in assets under management. Uh, but the one thing I do always stress about this slide is the growth has been prudent. It's been done properly. And I've been at Centurion, again, for over, just over 10 years. And there's been certain periods of time when we're not taking investors' capital because we're not gonna take your money and figure out what to do with it. We're gonna take your money and then we know exactly what we're gonna do with it, which I think is very important. And it's also add to that as well, we don't chase deals. We don't get in bidding wars. If we don't get our deal, we don't get our price. We're very happy to sit on the sidelines, which I think is very important. I mean, obviously the price you pay for an investment really dictates the returns you're able to generate. So I, I've been really over my years, but you know, I'll say this before Centurion, I was at an ETF firm. I was at a mutual fund firm. I really appreciate the strong discipline acquisition discipline, how they manage the fund, how they operate the buildings at Centurion. It really does reward investors and protects you as well. The gentleman on top is Greg Roman, the founder of Centurion. Um, quick bio on him. He was a former derivatives trader. He worked in Toronto, New York, London, Hong Kong, and Singapore uh, for, for some major investment banks. His last job was in Singapore, senior managing director in, uh, or partner rather for AIG, running their emerging markets derivatives trading desk. And I just highlight that is because his job was basically to help obviously his clients at that time, you know, structure deals, minimize risk, you know, find opportunities in the marketplace. And he's taking that same mindset, like you avoid risk as much as you can, as understand what the risk is. And he would help his clients do that. But again, he's brought that, that mindset to Centurion and he's always looking longer term. We're not here to kind of make a quick buck over here, a quick buck over there. Um, he finds what he likes understands all the risk as much as you can and invest for the longer term. And I'll say this, being in Canada is a great place to be. It's nice and boring in Canada. We're not exciting, but I think most investors appreciate appreciate that these days. Uh, the gentleman below is who steps in if Greg gets hit by that proverbial bus, but uh, Greg's 55. He's not retiring before he's 75. Uh, but even so, he's built up a firm, great executives, analysts, operations, best sales team in the country. Um, that's going to last well past his, uh, his tenure at Centurion. People usually laugh when I say best sales team in the country. But thank you. <laughs> this is the target return for the REIT, uh, seven to 12%. As Cynthia mentioned, it is apartment buildings, student housing, mortgages, and a little bit of equity in those, uh, but it is Canada, 160 buildings, 156 are based here in Canada. And our target return is seven to 12. That's income plus appreciation. And since inception, the return, as you can see, or not on this slide, but since inception, the annualized return has been 12.62%. And I'll say one of the great things about this is one, obviously you invest in apartment buildings, you get an attractive income, that tax, there's a tax efficient income that comes with that. So it's about 85% rock last year. We never know what it's gonna be until after we have our audit. Uh, but since inception, it's usually been in that kind of 60 to 70 range. I would expect it may be a bit higher going forward, but always look conservatively, say rock should be in the 60 to 70% range for you as the investors. Um, great thing about this is it's available for every type of investment account possible. Lifts, rifts, liras, non-registered money, everything. And another great thing about this is who's here is an actual landlord themselves. And I would expect we got, yeah, we got a few in the crowd, but this is as close as you can get to direct real estate ownership with none of the headaches. You're not going to get, you know, we're not going to get you to chase down someone who's not paying their rent. You're not going to fix the pipes if they burst and, you know, over the Christmas holidays, as close as you can possibly get. So I think that's a real incentive. And I'll show you a few in a few slides this, but it's very diversified. Again, 22,000 apartment buildings, or sorry, 22,000 units. So you get that almost as close as you can get direct exposure with true diversification for you. And you get a nice little, uh, you know, cash distribution paid out monthly. Um, and again, I like to say it's nice and boring. It's because it is private and it's based off of fundamentals. We value every one of our buildings every month and we work with a third-party appraiser to do that. Um, and then we have a full audit every year. 
by KPMG. And they bring in their real estate valuations team that audits our third party appraisal. And everything, every one of those, you know, monthly uh, valuations is overseen by our board of trustees, which is majority independent as well. Like I say, we have all the best practices you would want to see as an investor. You can go to our website. You can read the offering memorandums, most recent ones. There's an archive for those, but you can read the OMs. You can read the financial statements. Everything's there. OMs, if you're having uh, sleeping issues, is a great, uh, great read for you. Very technical. But... And here's the return since inception. Year to date, we are 7.31%. So obviously within our target, target return of 7 to 12. Um, I'll just point out a few, few years here is 2017 to 2019, exceptional years, obviously 17 to 24%. Um, we were, you know, it was a great time to be a landlord. Obviously, I think we're seeing similar somewhat situations now, uh, but we had waiting lists of like 50, 60, 100 people for any vacancies that we were getting. Uh, the main was outrageous. Um, we were well behind on the supply side then. We did exceptionally well, I would say, during COVID, which is the 2020 or 2020 number. So we managed, I think, exceptionally well through a time of uncertainty. Um, and I'll just touch on last year's number of 6.52%. Uh, and that was the buildings were operating very well. Our stabilized occupancy rate is 90, was 98.5%. It's just that cap rates, capitalization rates. If you're not familiar with them, are the yield, if you will, that you generate from a building. So if you buy a building for $10 million and you get a million dollar yield or payout, then your cap rate is 10%. So just a way to measure what you're, what you're getting paid. Um, cap rates do trend with, not simultaneously, not there's not a direct correlation between cap rates and interest rates, but they do trend after them. Um, so last year we did see a bump up in cap rates in some of our areas, some of the areas that we own buildings. Um, so that brought the performance down, but operationally the properties are doing extremely well. Um, again, you know, we're seeing waiting lists on our buildings. Occupancy rate again is 98.5%. So things were looking extremely attractive. So we expect very, very positive things going forward. And I like this because it gives you a sense of the, where the returns come from. And obviously the dark blue is NAV appreciation. Our NAV started at $10 in August of 2009. Now it's $24.11. But you can see it's the income. And I always look at it. We're buying a hard asset. You're buying an apartment building. This is a long-term investment. And the benefit of you hold it and you don't need your distribution is such a 2% dividend or sorry, 2% discount on the reinvestment price. So that adds a little incremental return for you. But you can see it's one of those things if you Give it time to work. It's going to work exceptionally well for you. And it's going to do without the stock market volatility. None of that uh, excitement. If, if you're looking for that, it can't help you. Let's just jump back to this one. Normally, we, we I could give you you know 15 slides on the fundamentals of the Canadian housing market, although I'm sure you've uh, seen all the headlines over the last couple of years. So I'll just use this one. And this, I think, articulates very well what we're seeing. One is obviously the spikes in... in uh, you know, population growth in the orange. You can see it's been rather dramatic over the last few years. And then I think even more telling is the bar chart at the bottom. You could see on average, you know, we build close to, you know, 200,000 200, housing units a year. You know, single family homes, apartments, condos, all of that together. So we've been consistently behind the eight ball. We're consistently not building anywhere near enough supply. And I say that reflects, again, coming to our buildings. You see the, you know, waiting lists for a lot of them. Like people need somewhere to live, they can't afford to buy, and it's increasingly getting worse. So I don't see an easy solution to that anytime soon. So it's great. Again, when I say a great time to be a landlord in Canada, it is a great time. And the great thing about this is uh, this is about where we have 82% of our buildings are in Ontario, Quebec, and BC. Uh, I come from Ontario. We're, we're built exceptionally slow. We're not fast at really doing anything. We're not great at building infrastructure. Um, <laughs> we we're supposed to finish our Union Station renovations before the Pan Am Games, and that was in 2015. So they're still working on some of that. So we're behind the eight ball again. Um, but the great thing about this is, you know, Ontario is about close to 40% of our portfolio, Quebec about 29, and then out in uh, here in BC about 18%. Um, but that's where we again we have the most exposure of the portfolio. That's where you're going to see obviously very strong demand because that's the biggest housing shortfall you can possibly see. We do have some assets in Alberta, um, a couple in Nova Scotia, a few in, in Saskatchewan, but really we're where the demand is the strongest. One, because people do move there to those areas. We do want to be in larger population centers, uh, but it's where the biggest shortfall is going to be and will continue to be. I mean, I'm an opt opt you know, I'll say optimistic guy, but we're not going to get ahead of this problem 
within seven to 10 years. So we're going to be chronically undersupplied on the housing side in Canada. And this breaks down where we're located. And the dark blue is the multi-residency apartment buildings. So again, it's primarily focused here in Canada. Um, we, I break it down geographically this way. In Ontario and BC, we're just, well, sorry, we're in the primary and secondary cities, but we're not downtown Vancouver. We're not downtown Toronto. That's not our price point. Our price point is we're looking for, you know, middle income type of tenants. We want people, you know, we have nice buildings, well-maintained, they're clean, condo-like, but a lot of them are, you know, with more amenities than you would see in the past. Uh, but again, we're out in the suburbs where it's more affordable for a lot of people. So obviously here we're in Surrey, up in Kelowna, uh, on the island, and, uh, you know, Langford, Victoria. Um, and the same thing in Ontario. We're not downtown Toronto. The price points there are ridiculous. It's uh, we're out in the suburbs, you know, Toronto, like out in the Scarborough, then Etobicoke, then down, you know, further field into Mississauga and southwest Ontario, um, a bit out, out east into Oshawa and then up in the capital region as well. Um, rest of the country, though, just the primary cities, as you can see in Alberta, just Edmonton and Calgary with our apartment buildings, Regina, Saskatchewan. Where you can see the chart. You can see the, the map there. Um, and that's very purposeful is we want to be where people are moving to. We want to be where people are going to live. I mean, we have very strong population growth in Canada, and a lot of it does come from immigration. We're a big country. We should be able to absorb that a lot better than we are. That's an entirely different conversation. But the demand is strong. The people come to Canada for opportunities. Should, we should be the land of opportunity. And they go to these larger population centers to live. It just naturally makes sense. More diverse economy, socially, economically, more diverse. diverse. So it makes sense. We want to be there. We want to be in those proper, in those areas. Um, the one to provide much needed housing, but obviously be able to provide an attractive return for investors. The orange is the student housing that we have in the portfolio. That's been a great business for us. Um, I mentioned overall our, our portfolio with 98 and a half stabilized occupancy rate. Uh, student housing is 100%. It's a great business. Our focus is 10, sorry, four year universities with 10,000 plus students. So if you've seen in the news lately, they're going to cut back on international students, zero impact to our portfolio. I can't stress that, zero impact. Um, the impact, I think, will be on those diploma mills, I think is a nice way to call them. So we're not going to see any, any impact on our portfolio there. Um, but again, it's large universities like in Montreal, or downtown, Concordia, McGill universities, downtown in Toronto for Ryerson University, um, Southwestern Ontario for London, or sorry, Western University in London, Laurier and Waterloo in Waterloo. Um, and one in Calgary. The building I just toured in Calgary, did that about a couple of weeks ago. Um, very new, four years old. Um, very close to U of C or University of Calgary and SAIT, which is the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. The one bedroom, and, uh, sorry, bachelor, which was 280 square feet, 284 square feet, was going for $14.25 a month. And there's a waiting list on that. The two bedrooms were going for about 12 Twelve fifty, so each bedroom was you know cost twelve fifty. So the unit itself was twenty five hundred for a two bedroom per month for student housing. And then again, there was a wait list on this. As soon as we have a vacancy for whatever reason, they they get gobbled up. You know, it's probably we're working through the you know the financing or sorry the lease ups for next year. The students have to start doing that as quickly as possible. So student housing is a great business to be in. But again, our focus is large universities and you know larger population centers where the demand is. I'll touch on the yellow, sorry, the, the white circle. And that's medical offices, not a business line for us normally. But we bought that about two years ago. And we saw that same portfolio of 10 buildings come on the market seven years before that. And we got it for a cheaper price than it was sold for 10 years prior. And it just wasn't done well. I think some people jump into real estate. They think it's easier than it is. Uh, it does take some a real skill set to run things properly. So we bought that uh, medical office at a great discount. At a very attractive price. Um, and I'll just tell you this. I mean, the, they weren't leased up properly. They weren't run properly. The only difference between the medical office, well, besides being a different, slightly different sector, is we have a partner in there who runs the day-to-day, -day, who does the operations. It's a former doc. That's their business. So they own 25% of those medical offices. We own the other 75. But I stress the other apartment buildings, the student housing we have, that's all Centurion staff. You know, we have our superintendents living in the buildings. Running the day to day. If you look at our, if you look at our, but we have like 360 employees. Probably half of those will be on the operations side. We do take that very seriously. Like the amount of number crunching that we do, um, the data we generate from from us from the call centers, uh, just to see the pricing that we we should you know list a vacancy at. 
because you know if it's for some reason vacancy is not going at two thousand dollars you change the price to 1987 maybe that clears it maybe you have to go a little bit lower but you, you're really playing around with the numbers very effectively they crunch a ton of data at centurion to find the one the best operations best way to manage the buildings best way to get tenants in there oh sorry the u.s properties we do have four down there two in texas one in kansas city one in minneapolis and I'll just get a quick example of why I always say we like Canada. It's nice and boring. Uh, we lent on that one of those properties in the U.S. And the developer bought the land, you closed on it officially. And this was back in like 2018. You developer buys the land, they officially close on, on, close on it two months later. Permits are in hand, ready to go. Get building, get to work. I was telling this to someone earlier today. That's not going to happen in Canada. That doesn't happen in Canada. Like we've seen it, like you, if you close on the property, it could take you two years. Three years, worst case scenario, four or five. Like then, the, then the projects usually don't make sense, and that's why you see condo projects fail. I mean, sometimes it just takes too long for you know things to get approved. The markets change, especially with a spike in interest rates. So Canada, I like to say, that's why I say we're chronically going to be undersupplied. We're just not going to get there fast enough. We're not going to be able to build fast enough. And just if I talk to our lenders, you know, that it could be City Hall is oh the building's too high, it's going to block the shade on the bill on the street, so you got to. Have it like push it back at a higher level. I'd say unit level 12 or 12 four, you got to push it back. But then the numbers don't make sense anymore. So in the building, well, should we go ahead with it? Then yeah, there's a little back and forth, and none of that's very fast. Um, or just the, the aesthetic appeal of the neighborhood will be ruined by the building. So they're not it's not going to go through. Like things are slow. <laughs> but again, I'm an optimistic guy. It's great to be in the REIT, but uh, we just don't get ahead of things. We're not going to get ahead of it. So that's why I say we're going to stick north of the border. We're going to be in a chronically on the slide, undersupplied market, but strong population growth. I think it's hard to find a better uh, combo. And this just gives you a bit more detail on the portfolio. But again, the focus is on uh, multi-residential. And again, if, from the investor's perspective, instant diversification. I mean, obviously, I mentioned 160 buildings, so just over 22,000 units. But again, you're diversified across the country in the major population centers. So... I mean, things can go great until they don't. And so something could happen in Quebec, whatever, whatever reason. Um, but you're well diversified across the country. So the impact could be minimal. That's the whole idea of one, diversification is a free way to reduce risk and doing that with real estate here in Canada. Oh, and sorry, I just sorry, touch on the lending that we have there. It is again about five and a half percent of the portfolio. It has been higher, but we really pulled back during COVID and, and, and into the spike in interest rates. Because uh, right now we're charging on average 13%. We're not cheap money. Like the big developers would go to the big banks and get the financing that they need. But that helps us provide, helps us build out a pipeline of acquisitions. So we know the developers, we're going to obviously charge them what we charge them, but we understand the projects. We, if we like the project, we put in the right or first refusal. And most of the time we like the project, if it makes sense. We like the fit. It's good for that neighborhood. We want to put a right or first refusal in. It doesn't necessarily guarantee us we're going to get the project. Uh, but it gives us our foot in the door and developers like that you know they know we want to buy it they know there's a willing buyer at the end of the day and so it makes their life easier if hey they can they complete the project they can sell it to us we can provide financing to them on other projects meaning more potential acquisitions for us down the road as well there's actually just a couple examples of uh, properties under development one the one in calgary is uh coming into the portfolio quite soon and uh nice nice build you know, on the edge near the the, sleece, the ski slope there, so you can, you know, go skiing and do all these wonderful things. But the difference we're seeing in uh, well, our acquisitions, and you'll see it in maybe the next few slides as well, is I say condo like because there's a big change in the marketplace. A lot of people are being priced out of home ownership, so we're seeing by far the most highly qualified tenants we've ever had. Uh, by that, like is income, credit score, if you, as much as you can, you can do a tenant uh, background check. So we're seeing people are making, I'll say, especially in Toronto, um, probably similar here is, you know, 100,000 plus that you're not able to buy into a home ownership where you want to buy a really run down bungalow out in the suburbs. So that may not be attractive for everyone. So the demand is there, extremely highly qualified uh, tenants. So we're seeing a bit of a change in the type of buildings that they want to live in. They want a certain lifestyle. So they're willing to pay that. They can't afford to pay for that. So you, if you see all of our acquisitions, I would say the ones we've done in the last couple of years, and what we do going forward, it is going to be, they look like condos. They've got the nice amenities, but they're positioned, again, removed in a lot of cases from the core, so you're not paying downtown prices. 
I say that, and I, I live downtown in Toronto. I bought my I bought my condo uh, like twelve and a half years ago. But the prices for a one bedroom are like renting renting wise are you know twenty five hundred and could be a four hundred square foot one bedroom. Like the prices get ridiculous. And it was just pre COVID. This was a project. It was like twenty nineteen, the summer twenty nineteen, just down the road from me. I live in kind of the King West area. Uh, there was a project coming online that was charging two thousand a square foot. And I was like, oh my God, I, I had to go in there into the, the showroom. Um, it's, you know, fancy Scandinavian design team and all of that. But the bachelors, it was actually, I remember this, the bachelor was 421 square feet. And it was even selling for, it was selling for 850,000. But the kicker was that 421 square feet included the balcony. So the actual inside was like 390. Oh my God. So you're paying top dollar. Like those prices were crazy. Like that, I mean, things have come down from that, sure. But I mean, when I say things are affordable, well, you're the one place that it is even more affordable. Um, this is an example of uh, one of the more recent acquisitions out in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. So in the Maritimes, we'll be, Dartmouth is a, is a suburb of Halifax. So we won't be going into PEI or anywhere like that. Um, great people, but we like the again larger population centers. But it's got the fitness room, the terrace, the underground parking, storage, this ensuite laundry. That's a big thing. Like you look, some of our older buildings, you have to go to the basement. All new buildings would have ensuite. Obviously, you want laundry right there. And this is similar up in Kelowna. We like Kelowna. This is phase three. I'm actually going to be closing on phase. Sorry, this is phase two. We'll be closing on phase three in, uh, I mean, sometime before the end of the year. But again, the amenities that you're looking for. So it's again condo like. And we're seeing actually just add to it more buildings with bigger units. Like it's not all, you know, younger people, you know, singles or couples living in these. We're seeing again a lot more people growing up in condos or growing up in apartment buildings. Just because again, they can't afford to jump into home ownership. But how long would you wait to say, you know, get married? How long would you wait to have kids? So they start having families in buildings, and we're seeing a bit of a reflection of that of larger units um, in the buildings that we're buying. And this just puts a bit of a, a number on the potential value that can be attributed to the REIT going forward. This is the rent to market gap. And if you put this in dollars, it's 46 million, which means if everyone in our portfolio signed a new, a new lease tomorrow, we would increase our rental income by $46 million. And if you discount that by the cap rate in our portfolio, which is 4.23%, you get just over a billion dollars in value to be attributed to the portfolio. Not gonna be realized tomorrow, but over time. And I do stress, this is not a static number. Like we are realizing some of this every year. Probably, you know, year to day, I think we would have realized, you know, seven or $8 million in increases in rents, but it's still the market, the gap continues to grow again, because the demand is there pushing up prices across the board. Does that make sense? And again, just come back to it. Nice boring chart. Who doesn't like that chart? <laughs> and I will touch on one thing here. I did mention it earlier, but I mean, again, the gentleman who founded the firm, Greg Roman, president and founder, um, but he's kind of built up an exceptionally strong team, like executives, analysts, operations. You know, it, he's built Centurion to really look long term. You know, make sure that we do things the right. You know, make the right decisions for long term for investors' benefit. And I'll come back to it: is the oversight that's in place is I'll say second to none. Um, again, monthly monthly valuations using a third party appraiser who brings that data and sits down with our finance team, who has obviously the rental income. Um, KPMG audits our financials. They bring in the real estate valuations team. Who, that's a very in depth process, but they want to make sure every one of those monthly valuations makes sense. So again, tremendous oversight. Board of Trustees reviews all of this. Um, it, and again, again, you can go to our website and see all of that if you're looking to. So it's a ton of information there, but it just shows you we want to have the best reporting possible, have the best practices possible as well.